Hello, everyone. Today's talk will be about finding causal relationships, specifically on Granger causality versus transfer entropy. My name is Rami Kushaba, and I'll be your presenter for today. So let's start. Causality is defined as the influence by which one event, process, state, or object, a cause, contributes to the production of another event, process, state, or object, an effect. Causal inference, on the other hand, is defined as the set of tools and principles that allow one to combine data and structural invariances about the environment to reason about the questions of counterfactual na nature. So what would have happened had reality been different? So let me explain what I mean. Imagine that the graph that you see over here is the number of people using the trains on a specific day. And let's say that on specific, on that specific day, there was an event planned in the afternoon. And if this is the number of people traveling on the network, because of that event, specific event, which could be, for example, an Easter show or a rock concert or anything else, the number of people significantly increased. So the question here would have been, for example, if you are looking at the counterfactual, what would have happened if the event didn't take place? What would the number of people be without that event? That event? In reality, you can either look at one of these situations. It's either that the event happened or the event didn't happen. So how would you answer that question? So causal inference allow you specifically to model, let's say the behavior before the event and then forecast what would have happened after that point in time, and then compare it to the reality, what did actually happen. And the causal impact is usually calculated as the difference between the two entire series after that part of time. For this specific lecture, I'm not going to talk about the tools used for causal inference in general, like these situations, but rather than the measures of causality. And specifically, I want to know if I have two time series, I need to know if X causes Y or Y causes X and to what extent. So what measures can I use for that specific problem? Before we go into the details of the measures, you need to understand two important properties of causality. The first one is the temporal precedence, where we say causes precede the effects. So if I show you two time series, I have X and Y, and I say that X causes Y, then whatever effect or whatever sorry, cause happened in X, it needs to precede the effect that actually appeared in Y. So whatever activity, let's say, happened in X, that need to be earlier in time. It need to have a temporal precedence on the same activity or the related activity shown in the next variable, which is Y. So that's temporal precedence. The other property is physical influence where we say manipulation of the cause changes the effect. So imagine that you have a knob and you are like turning this knob left and right, and the uh, variation in the knob will actually be reflected in the uh, changes in the effect as well. So these are the two of most important properties of causality. Now, because we are going to talk about Granger causality and we are going to use regression for that, and yes, it is actually based on regression, you need to know that regression analysis can be used for prediction and for causal analysis. So when you, you, know, when you use um, regression analysis in a prediction study, the goal is to develop a formula for making predictions about the dependent variable based on the observed values of the independent variable. In other words, you use the features, your input features, or the independent variables where you denote them usually as x1, x2, x3, and so on, to um, make a prediction about the dependent variable, which is usually referred to as y. In the causal analysis, the independent variables are regarded as causes of the dependent variable. So not only saying that these inputs correlate to the output, we are not only looking at correlation anymore or the simple statistics, we are going to the next level. We need to infer causation. Which variable, which of the different variables causes the um, dependent variable to behave in a certain way? So the aim here is to de determine whether a particular 
independent variable really affects the dependent variable and to estimate the magnitude of that effect, if any. Moving forward, before we dive in into the details about the causality measures, it's important for you to know that despite the hype about AI and like what's happening nowadays with big data, you need to know that most machine learning based projects focus on predicting outcomes rather than understanding causality. However, in the recent years, we have been finding that causality is important for building predictive machine learning models especially if you are interested in out-of-domain generalizations. So nowadays, most of the, let's say, latest development in machine learning and AI in general are actually looking into incorporating concepts of causality into the latest developments of their models. So as one example, if you Google it, there is something nowadays called causal reinforcement learning, if you know much about reinforcement learning in your research. So there are a lot of recent articles that are coming out about the machine learning and their relationship with the causal inference. So these are some of them. I just listed them here for you if you wanna read more about them. And some very interesting videos that are also available. One of them is like a talk from Microsoft about the foundations of causal inference and its impact in machine learning. I really suggest you go and watch these videos on YouTube. So, Causality test, um, we picked the following measures for the presentation of today. The first one is about Granger causality, and the second one is about transfer entropy. So Granger causality is a statistical causality test, which provides a way to investigate causality in terms of prediction. So what I'm going to use today, I'm going to use autoregressive models to come out with a indication or a measure of causality. And this is what Granger causality is all about. On the other hand, transfer entropy, which is another, let's say, measure of causality that has been used like for causality, um, is an inform information theoretic measure based on entropy estimation that quantify the statistical coherence between the systems evolving in time. So again, Granger causality is a statistical measure and transfer entropy is an information theoretic measure. Granger causality, look at the power of prediction. Like if I have X and Y, two variables, can I um, enhance the estimation of the future of Y by looking at the past values of Y as well as the past values of X? While with transfer entropy, we say, can I reduce the entropy or the uncertainty about the future of Y while using the past of y and the past of x. So that's why we say statistical versus information theoretic approach based on entropy. So Granger causality has been a leading concept for decades in the field of finance and other fields like neurophysiology, metrology, and many other fields. Transfer entropy, on the other hand, is a nonlinear generalization of Granger causality test stemming from information theory, as we've said, and it also has been applied on so many different fields nowadays to infer linear and nonlinear causal effects. Moving forward, it's important to differentiate between correlation and causation. So we always say correlation does not imply causation. So just for two curves to behave the same way, it doesn't mean that one of them is actually causing the other. There are so many examples that you can have a look in this website, very nice to see, but you need to understand that correlation does not imply causation. Okay? Now, let's start with Granger causality. Let's see how this test is developed and how do we understand like the process of it. Granger causality, as we said, is a statistical concept of causality in which we try to say if a signal X, Granger causes, also like written in the literature, we'll see um, they, people refer to this um, causality test as G causes, which means Granger causes a signal Y. Then the past values of X should contain information that help predict Y above and beyond the information contained in the past values of y alone. So if I can draw over here, let me pick this. Let's say this is one time series. 
And let me see if I can put another time series over here. Let's say this is X. And let's say this is Y. So what we try to do over here, we say, okay, can I predict the future? Let's say the future is here, okay? Can I predict the future of Y by looking at the past values of Y as well as the past um, values of X? So is X, the past values of X, are these values providing any useful information to predict the future of Y beyond what the past values of Y itself are offering. So in, in um, its mathematical formulation is based on linear regression modeling of stochastic processes. So more complex extensions to nonlinear cases exist. However, these extensions are often more difficult to apply in practice. So let's move forward. So for, um, for us to understand Granger, uh, Granger causality, let's dive in into a little bit more details. So a time series X is said to Granger causes Y if it can be shown using a series of t-test and f-test and lagged versions of X that those values um, of X provide statistically significant information about the future values of Y. So the original definition of Granger causality does not account for latent, uh, latent confounding effects, does not capture instantaneous and nonlinear causal relationships, though several extensions have been proposed to address these issues. Now, let's uh, make it simpler. So imagine that I have one time series. And by the way, we will be switching between using past of y to predict the future of x or using the past of x to predict the future of y. So hang on with me. Imagine that I have one time series and I'm using an autoregressive model with an order of p. In such a model, I use the previous values of x, so x of t minus 1, the previous time step, the previous two time steps, and the previous p time steps to predict the current time step. So I'm using the previous values of x to predict the future value of x. And we say we have p parameters because this is an autoregressive model of order p, as you can see over here. We usually refer to this modeling as a restricted model. Restricted because you are only looking at the past values of x itself. What we do then after finishing this modeling process with an AR autoregressive model of order P is that I bring another variable. So now, instead of only looking to predict the future value of X by looking at the previous time steps of X, we also include the previous time steps of Y, which is another time series. And again, you will go from T minus one up until T minus P. And you will have different set of parameters for the past values of X and different set of parameters for the past values of Y. And we call this unrestricted model, UM. So you have a restricted model and you have unrestricted model. In the restricted, you use the previous values of X to predict the future of X. And in the unrestricted model, you use the previous values of X as well as the previous values of Y to predict the future of X. And then you wanna see if the predictions between the two models are statistically significantly different. So what you need to see is that is any of these lagged parameters from Y having a significant impact in predicting the future values of X? So this could be significant. The second one could be non-significant. The last one could be significant. And then you run an F test on the whole lot to see if the outcomes are totally significant. So again, use two models. One of them is restricted and one of them is unrestricted. So over here, we switched it. We say we're trying to predict the future of Y by using the previous values of Y. And I'm using a model order of three. I goes from one to three. And I have a few, um, let's say, coefficients. And then I use an unrestricted version. And I repeat the original model, but I add the parameters for the 
previous values of x. So I'm trying to estimate the future of y by looking at the previous values of y as well as the previous values of x. And the job over here is that to look at these coefficients, the beta, and say, like, is at least one of these significant? If yes, then you have to, like, look at the significance in terms of the p-values. So in the first case, the beta values will be all zeros because there are no previous terms for x. While in the second case, we hope to see at least one of these to be significant, which is not zero. So the null hypothesis is there and the alternative hypothesis, hypothesis is here. So what we say is that the null hypothesis is that, for example, y does not Granger causes x or x does not Granger causes y. You can switch them depending on which one you're actually looking at. And in the alternative hypothesis, you say y does Granger causes y or at least one of the lags of y is significant. And then what you do you run a bunch of t-tests and f-tests, which is kind of automated for you these days. The function is available, as I will show you later on. So you run that and you compare the restricted model versus the unrestricted model, and you look at the value of the p-value, the magnitude of the p-value, the significant levels. Um, and you hope that will be less than 0.05. And you perform the test for both directions, x on y and y on x to see like which one is causes which and to which or to what amount. Again, so what you do, you try to model one of the variables by using its own history. And then you try to model the same variable by using its history and it's the history of another variable or another time series. So another way to look at this is by looking at the variance of the error terms. So this is the error term and this is the error term for the two equations, you look at the variance of them. If the history of y is not adding any benefit or any significance or any, like, let's say, um, amount of worthy information, then what you get is what? The same as the, like, values provided by the history of x itself. So the variance of the first equation will be equivalent to the values of the second. So that will be one, and the log of one is zero. If, if, the, um, like if the second equation is providing uh, more information, then you will have a specific value over here. And then you start measuring how much x affects y and how much y affects x and so on. Now, because I'm looking at a time series, what we usually do is that we use a sliding window approach. So I have to pick up a window from each of the time series, x and y. And the question here is, how big should the window size be? Well, um, it depends on many factors. But you have to know, for example, for like it can be a large window or it can be a small window. If you use a short window, you will end up with worse model estimation, but you will have better temporal resolution because your window is small. And if you use long windows, you will have better model estimation, but you will have worse temporal resolution. So you have to be careful. Usually, if you are looking at signals like EMG or EEG, let's say um, 100 or 200 millisecond is typically used within these research like studies. So you use a window of 100 millisecond or 200 or 500 millisecond, and then you um, process with a autoregressive model of order P, and then you start analyzing the significance of the values. But because we are uh, like talking about the model order. So the next question is how to pick up the model order or the number of lags. So what I'm saying is that I'm trying to model the window with a few parameters. And I'm trying to estimate the impact of these parameters. Um, let's say the past of X and the past of Y on the future value of X. But how many model parameters or model order? Like how do I pick it? What's the procedure over here? So the way to do this, the proper way to do this, is that you have to experiment with different um, model order. You have to vary that number of parameters. And you try different orders. And then you have to look at some um, relevant measures, like the archaic information criteria. Or you can look at Bayesian information criteria, any one of them. 
and then you like try um, several different model orders and pick the model order that minimizes the chosen information criteria. So this has been in the literature since a long time. If you just Google it in Python, MATLAB, or any other language, you will find heaps of implementations that give you these, like automate these sort of analysis for you based on the input data. Um, there's also some like recent um, like papers talking about variable lag Granger causality and transfer entropy for time series analysis. So this is one example, which is also recent from 2021, which you can also have a look at. Very interesting set of papers that you can find over there. So Granger test in Python is very easy. You just need to import the function from stats model. So that's Granger causality test. And then you provide um, your data frame with the two columns that you want to test and you specify the maximum lag. And then what you get is the result of the F test and you look at the P value. So if the P value is less than 0.05, it means that in this case, X have a significant causal impact on the number of X has a significant causal impact on the number of chicken. So you can switch it. You can investigate if the chicken has a significant number of chicken has like significant causal impact on the X. And using the same maximum lag, you can find that the p-value is not significant. So who causes who? That's the chicken and egg problem. Now, let's move on to transfer entropy. Because as you saw, Granger causality is very simple. You are just trying to put one autoregressive model to model the future of X by looking at its past, and then the future of X by looking at its past and the past of another variable. And if the two, um, like let's say equations will provide significantly different results. If, it, if they do, then the second variable definitely adds some causal impact according to the Granger causality test. So instead of using statistics as we saw and looking for prediction power, we now focus on transfer entropy. And we try to predict the same thing by using um, information theory and the concept of entropy. So as you imagine, because we spoke about entropy, so we have to refer back to the definition of what Shannon entropy. So given a discrete random variable X and a possible um, set of outcomes, which occur with probability P of X1 up until P of X of N, the entropy of X is usually defined as what? Minus summation P log P. And we have studied this in one of the previous videos on entropy and information theory. I really suggest you go back and watch that uh, video lecture because add more details to how we estimate this. But I'll try to repeat some of the concepts from there in this video to make it complete. So intuitively, the entropy um, h of x of a discrete random variable is a measure of the amount of uncertainty associated with the values of x when only its distribution is known. And over here, we are looking at the probability of x, which is the denoted as the marginal probability, because you are talking about one variable, which is x. How do we estimate this? As we previously mentioned in one of the videos, if I have a time series and I want to construct that entropy measure, so what I do, I have to find first the probabilities that I need to estimate the entropy, as you saw from the equation. So what we do is that we look at, for each time series, I look at the minimum value and the maximum value, as you see over here. I find out the range, which is the maximum minus the minimum. Select a number of histogram bins, because I'm going to assume that I'm using the histogram approach as explained in the previous video. And then I'll divide the range by the number of histogram bins. So what I do is that I divide the range between the minimum value and the maximum that I found over here. I divide it into 10 equivalent portions. So what I do then to estimate probabilities, I go back and look at the time series that I have. And I'll say how many values from the time series fall within the range of the first bin, which is 0.1 to 0.34. So I look at the number of values or instance where the signal amplitude was between 0.1 to 0.34. Then I go back again and look how many values 
from the X time series fall within the range of 0.34 and 0.58 and so on for the remaining bins. And then I start constructing my histogram. But right now, this is based on the counts. It's not really a probability. So the way for us to turn this into probabilities is to divide by the total number of samples, which in this case, there are 150 samples. Once you do that, you will um, turn that histogram into a set of probabilistic um, histogram, let's say values. So now that I have the probabilities I want, all what I need to do is plug in these values, each of these values into this equation to calculate the entropy of this time series. And we have explained this in a previous video, and that's why I'm not like um, going into more details than this. This is basically all what you need to know. Find the range, um, pick a number of bins, and this is up to you to decide, and you have to experiment with that. Divide the range into a number of equivalent bins, and then calculate the number of values that fall within each of the bin limits, and then divide by the total number of samples, and you get your probabilities. Once you get your probabilities, um, plug them here and get your entropy. Now, if you have four features, as we discussed previously, so one, two, three, four, this is a classification problem, let's say, with the classes, like the first 50 samples belonging to class one, next 50 samples belonging to class two, and the third um, 50 samples belonging to class three, and this is the iris data set, you can start looking at the entropy of the different um, features or variables and you will do the same thing. So you will look at the minimum and the maximum for each of the variables, construct the histogram, and these are the bins for the, let's say, first variable or first feature, second one, third one, and the fourth one, because I have four variables. And based on this technique, I will um, calculate the probabilities for each of the bins, for each of the features, and then I will plug each row values to calculate four different entropies, each one for each of the features. So I'm just repeating what we have gone through in the previous video over here. Now, there's also a joint um, entropy where you have two variables, X and Y. So in this case, um, think of it as the, for example, the position of a chess piece where X could be the row and Y could be the column. So in this case, similarly to the previous equation where you had P log P, now you have two variables and you can simply say the entropy or the joint entropy of the two variables is given by the minus double summation P of X and Y log P of X and Y. And that probability, because now you're talking about two variables, this is called joint probability rather than the marginal probability of a single variable. Now, how do you calculate the joint probability distribution? So we discussed this also in the previous video. And we said, let's assume I have two time series, um, like X and Y, and we do the same thing. We find the minimum, find the maximum, like we did previously for each of the time series. Okay, so you find that and you select the number of bins, which is 10 in this case, like we did over here. And then I go back to the signal and I say, how many times do the values of the first time series fall within the range of 0.1 to 0.34, while the values of the second time series fall within the range of 1 to 1.59? And I add the count over here. Then I go back again and say, how many times do the values of the first time series fall within the range of 0.1 to 0.34, while the values of the second time series fall within the range of 1.59 to 2.18? And I add the count into the second bin. And if you continue doing that, you will end up with something like this, which is the joint entropy for the two variables or two features. And then you apply this equation to figure out the joint entropy. Now, I went a little bit fast on the like last few slides because we have discussed this in the earlier video, but now this is the most important aspect of the work. So let's pay some attention to it. We um, use Venn diagrams to represent entropies usually. So I use a Venn diagram and as you can see, one circle represent h of x, which is the entropy of x, 
and another circle that, or another like diagram that represent the um, entropy of Y. Because of these circles are not overlapping, they are completely separated from each other, we say that X and Y, the variables, are independent. There is no relationship between them. So this means that X and Y are independent. Now, things start to get excited when these circles go toward each other and they become overlapped, as you can see over here. So again, the orange circle is the entropy of X, the blue circle is the entropy of Y. Um, the joint part, we call this the mutual information. So if I go here and point this side, so this is the amount of information that X knows about Y and Y knows about X, which is this. We call this what? The mutual information, which is I of X and Y, okay? Let me remove it. So if I go back there again, and I try to look at the remaining, um, the, uh, let's say values, H of X given Y is the entropy or the uncertainty uh, remaining about X after knowing Y. So what I say is that I had the original orange circle, which is uncertainty about um, X. How much of that do I have left after having the new circle, the blue circle? So if you trace this, you will see that the remaining entropy about X given Y is only this part, okay? And similarly, the remaining entropy about Y, the blue circle, the remaining uncertainty about the blue circle given X is that remaining portion of the blue circle after knowing X. So again, this is the mutual information, how much X knows about Y and how much Y knows about X, and it's the same amount. Um, this is the remaining uncertainty about X after knowing Y, and this is the remaining uncertainty about Y after knowing X. Okay? We will move forward and then start to relate these concepts to the concepts of causality. Okay. Um, if you want to calculate the entropy of Y given X, which is the remaining portion over here that we mentioned, the equation is very similar to the joint entropy, the way we calculated the joint entropy, but we just divide by P of X which you already know how to calculate now by using the histogram approach. And if you wanna calculate the mutual information between X and Y, there are so many different ways you can calculate it. So let's see. One of them says H of X, like if I wanna calculate this portion over here, mutual information between X and Y, one way to do it, what I can do is I can look at H of X, which is the full orange circle, the full orange circle, sorry for my drawing is a little bit bad, minus the entropy of X um, after knowing Y. So the same thing, you just take away the entropy of X after knowing Y. So take this portion away and what you end up here is this part. So that's how you calculate it. Erase all, and then I go back here again to see if I can do it using a different way. So I can do it by saying H of X, let's pick the third one, which says the orange circle, which is H of X, okay, plus the blue circle, which is H of Y. And if you plus these two together, it's like you took this part twice. So if you subtract these two, H of X plus H of Y from H of X and Y, which is the outer envelope of the two. So which is this and this. So if you subtract them from this, you end up with only the joint portion, which is the mutual information. Okay. And this is how we calculate them. So now again, this is the uncertainty about X, uncertainty about Y, 
and we are trying to see how much uncertainty is left about x after knowing y. So when the blue circle comes in, you can see that the blue circle is already covering a portion of the orange circle. So you reduce the uncertainty about the orange circle, you reduce its size. And similarly for the blue circle, after knowing the orange circle, you reduce the uncertainty about it and you only have this portion left. Okay, let's move forward. The more you push the two circles inside, the more the joined part will grow bigger. So the mutual information will be bigger, I of X and Y, and the uncertainties will go smaller because now these variables know a lot about each other. They can cover bigger portions about each other and the uncertainty will grow smaller. So this is how you calculate mutual information as we mentioned in the previous slides. And there's also um, the normalized mutual information version, which you have to know about because these uncertainties could be of different sizes. They, they are not of the same size all the time. So what you do, you need, when you say the remaining uncertainty about X after knowing Y, you have to divide by the entropy of X, for example, because you have to get a proportion of the total size of X remaining because their sizes are different. And similarly, so you can take the mutual information. If you want a normalized version of the mutual information, you can take this portion and divide it by the entropy of X, or you can take it and divide by the entropy of Y. And um, in the literature, there is a redundancy measure, which is also given as the mutual information between X and Y divided by the entropies of X and Y. So another version or variant of this measure. Now, things are getting more excited. Now I have three variables. So what do I do about this? How do I calculate the remaining uncertainty? So before I go into more details, um, let's explain some of the concepts over here. So again, the orange circle is the uncertainty of X and the blue circle is the uncertainty or the entropy of Y. And the green circle is the uncertainty about the values of Z, so H of Z. Now, if I wanna look at this portion, which is uncertainty left about X after knowing Y and Z. So the uncertainty left about the um, orange after knowing the green and the blue. So the green already covered this portion, the blue already covered this portion, and the remaining uncertainty about X is this. Now, similarly, how much uncertainty is left about Y after knowing X and Z? So Z covered this portion, X covered this portion. So the uncertainty left about the blue circle is this amount. And similarly, you can say about the third one. So how much uncertainty is left about Z after knowing X? After knowing X, I reduce the green by this portion. And after knowing Y, I reduce it by this portion. And the remaining part, oops, is this amount. All right. Now, let me take these. The mutual information between the three of the circles is what? I of X and Y and Z, which is covered by this amount, okay? The mutual information between X and Y, the blue and the orange circle, after knowing Z, as you can expect, it will be what? Originally, it was this before knowing Z, and now because of Z, you reduced it by this amount. So let me take these off. And you say, this is the mutual information between X and Y given Z. All right, let's move forward. Now, the question we posed at the time, we said, what is the difference if I, if I put a semicolon or just a comma? And the answer is that basically, when you say I of X comma Y semicolon um, Z, it means the mutual information between 
X and Y with Z and Z. So these two together versus Z because of the comma between them. And if you say between X and Y and Z in this way, you say it's actually between X and the set of X, uh, Y and Z, as you can see. And in this case, between the first set of X1 and X2 versus the second set of Y1 and Y2. Now, this is all about entropies and mutual information. Where the hell is causation? Where does causation come in in this? How do I find causality? If you look into the literature, there is something called transfer entropy. As we said, it's been used as a measure of causation and it's non-parametric statistic measuring the amount of directed transfer of information between two random processes. So look at the definition. I'm not gonna talk about the like text, whatever. Just look at the equations. What does it tell you? Two entropy terms. One term that has two, um, let's say variables, y of t and the past values of y of t. And the second one, which looks at the y of t, the past values of y of t and the past values of x of t. Okay, so it goes from t minus one to t minus l and t minus one to t minus l. But it's what? It's a bunch of entropies. So can we put them as circles? That's what we are planning to do here today. Let's do that. So I will have the entropy of yt given its past and the entropy of yt given its past and the past of another variable, which is the past of x. Can I put them in terms of the Venn diagrams and simplify things for you to show you how to calculate transfer entropy? Let's have a look. Bring me the three circles that we had a look at earlier. Let's call the first one the orange. So you remember we had h of x, h of y, h of z. Forget about that. Let's call this h of y. Let's call the green h of y of t minus 1 up until t minus l, which is the past values, the entropy of the past values or version of y, and the entropy of the past values of x. Let's bring them here. I have three circles. So we looked at the relationship between these and we were able to draw. Okay. Now, for the first term, I don't have three variables. I only have two. So what I'm going to do, let's remove the blue. And let's say that I have the entropy of y of t and the entropy of the past values of y of t. Now, the remaining entropy after knowing the past values of y, so the remaining of the orange circle, after knowing the past values, the green, as you can expect, it will be what? This portion, the one I mark for you in blue. Now, because of that, this is like, basically this represents the blue um, region over here represent the first term, which is the remaining uncertainty about H of Y after knowing its past values. Get rid of the remaining. It's a lovely moon shape. Now that's the first term. Bring me the three circles again. Now I have Y of T, the past values of Y of T and the past values of X of T. Name them and tell me, draw them yourself before I show you, tell me where is the remaining of the orange circle after knowing the green and the blue. Should go something like this and this and that. So if you want to plot it, I can say something like here, here and here. Sorry for my drawing, it's really bad. Take them and get rid of the whole drawing if possible. Put a blue region over there. That's the remaining uncertainty about y of t after knowing its own past and the past of another variable x. Okay, so here are the two terms that I've shown you here in the equation. Go ahead and tell me where is the transfer entropy? Well, the transfer entropy is simply what? the subtraction or the difference between the two. The first term minus the second term. As you can see from here, what do you think, or where do you think that portion will come through? So do you see the difference between the two? Can you tell me what is the difference between the two? Well, obviously it's just this portion. And that's your T of X to Y, the transfer uh, entropy from x to y, the amount of information, 
okay, transferring from one to the other. So oh, the amount over here, you reduced uncertainty. You remember, H is entropy. Entropy means uncertainty. So uncertainty and information, we discussed the relationship in the previous video. So go ahead and watch that video to give you some context. So look at how uncertain you were before knowing the past of X and look at how uncertain you are after knowing the past of X. The less uncertain means the more information. The more uncertain means less information. So definitely X or the past values of X added some significant portion over here, some amount of information, okay, to the equation because it reduced your uncertainty by a big portion. And that's the shield that you can see here, which is the transfer entropy from X to Y. And then you can repeat the th whole thing, but instead of entropy of Y and its past, and then against the entropy of past value for of X, bring X and the past of X versus the um, entropy of the past values of Y. That's it. You calculated transfer entropy using Venn diagrams. So transfer entropy versus Granger causality. If you um, refer to the literature, there are some really nice papers to read. So some of them says transfer entropy was found to be more precise than Granger causality. And the causality maps derived from it were more visually interpretable. While um, Granger causality was found to be easier to automate, much less computationally expensive and easier to interpret. So it depends. In terms of computational complexity, I wouldn't say much more expensive because it depends on how you implement it using which approach. Um, some of the other interesting um, papers, there's a special issue in the Journal of Entropy on causality, transfer entropy and Granger causality. You can read some of the papers, very nice papers. So transfer entropy is a nonlinear generalization of the Granger causality, as we mentioned and is therefore model free and accounts for both linear and non-linear causal effects. Other very nice like papers to read as well. Um, trans says transfer entropy is able to measure the time directed in, uh, transfer of information between stochastic variables and therefore provide asymmetric method, which means the amount of information that transfer from X on to Y does not necessarily have to be the same amount of information that transfer from Y to X. Um, other very interesting papers, it says, hang on, both of Granger causality and transfer entropy are exactly the same when the distribution of the variables is what? Gaussian. So if all processes are jointly Gaussian, Granger causality and transfer entropy are entirely equivalent. And this is what this paper found. Thus, bridging autoregressive and information theoretic approaches to data-driven causal inference. So that one, that's one interesting finding by itself as well. Another one from scientific reports, where it says the success of both measures or approaches strongly depends on the characteristics of the system under study, its dimensionality, the strength of the coupling, and the length of the temporal resolution of the data, the window size, and the level of noise contamination, etc. Both approaches can fail in distinguishing genuine causal interactions from correlations that arise due to similar governing equations or correlations that are induced by the presence of common external forcing. So you say, does X cause Y or Y cause X? Well, in the absence of Z, there could be another variable Z, which you don't see. Z could be causing both of them. If you don't see Z, how do you tell which causes, what causes what? In addition, when the system under study is composed by more than two interacting uh, processes, um, Granger causality and transfer entropy can return fake causalities, i.e. fail to discriminate between direct and indirect causal interactions. So you have to be careful about your findings. One interesting application in neuroscience, and this is in the field of sleep, the authors here identified an increasing um, anterior to posterior causal influences during transition from waking to sleep by analysis of EEG signals. So while you switch from wake to sleep, there is more causal impact from the channel F3 and the other channels, as you can see over here, and PZ to OZ and P3 to the other channels, according to the 1020 International System. 
So more resources, you can watch this video about what is missing towards human level AI. And the first thing, this is by the way, this is Josh, uh, Joshua, oh, Joshua, sorry, Benjio. And the first thing that he mentioned, what does understanding mean? They capture causality. So there's a huge need for causality if you wanna to go toward human level AI. More resources are here for your reference. So go ahead and have a look at these. There's a course about causal inference and some very interesting books, including the one by Jodea Pearl, which is the um, Turing Award winner in this field. So thank you very much. I hope you learned something today. Thank you.